Welcome back everybody. Now we are going to talk about me. So again, I advise you to open the PowerPoint, uh, perhaps even a book on the knee chapter and we are going to start. So let's go to the next slide or the second slide or the first slide with some type of information actually we can use. Uh, so knee joint, we are talking about three bones, femur, tibia and patella. Uh, what can we do with the knee? Well, the knee has two degrees of freedom. And we mentioned that before, although uh, when you look at uh, the knee and, you, when, and when you're looking at the movement at the knee, you can see readily only flexion and extension, but in order to extend your knee, there is actually needed a uh, rotation. So knee has, in addition to flexion and extension, uh, um, internal and external rotation. So technically knee has two degrees of freedom. Uh, patella is of course this uh, uh, smaller triangular shaped bone which is embedded in muscle. It's embedded more precisely in your quadriceps. Um, in um, even more precisely in quadriceps tendon. Okay? In a relaxed position, the apex of the patella lies just proximal to the knee joint line. So, of course, uh, patella has a couple of important uh, tasks. Uh, first is protection for our knee joint, which otherwise would be very vulnerable, but also helps uh, quadricep muscles. Quadricep is a group, of course, of four muscles, knee extensors. And we will talk about um, the case when uh, or how muscle work with and without patella by the end of this uh, presentation. So three articulations uh, and three articulating surfaces is a medial tibiofemoral, lateral tibiofemoral, and patellofemoral, which we are going to see that on the next slide. The next slide, it says bones of the knee, and you can um, see all the necessary features uh, on those drawings. So you got um, very nicely pre presented lateral view, anterior view, and posterior view. And um, those features are very important. Uh, the knee joint is actually a very, very complex joint. It's one of the most complex joints actually in our body. And we will talk about that in more details in the next slides. Um, as you can see, what else I would like to actually uh, to pay attention to it, uh, to the smaller bone fibula. Fibula is actually much smaller bone, much um, less significant in size, in mass. And as you can realize just by looking at those drawings that, uh, that fibula is actually a non-weight bearing bone. So why do we have it? Why is it important? Well, actually works as a support for tibia and to um, help with proper alignment of the tibia. But really only femur and tibia are weight bearing bones. You can clearly see that fibula is kind of like attached to the side of the tibia and does not bear any weight. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And there are some landmarks which I would like you to recognize as you look at the pictures. Introcondylar notch, medial and lateral female, uh, femoral condyles, medial lateral tibial plateaus, tibial tuberosity and popliar fossa. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. And all you need to do is kind of orient yourself again to have this mental picture. So when we are talking about features of the knee, uh, you understand where we are and what are we talking about. Okay, so it's very important that you take a look at the pictures. You kind of find those features um, for your own understanding. So let's go to the next slide. It's not much I, I, I can explain it over here. It's just pure anatomy. You just look at the picture, 
uh, and, and those features pointed uh, to yourself, orient yourself, create this mental map uh, of, uh, of the bones and, uh, and the joints and that's pretty much all it is to say about those. So joints of the knee, now we talk about uh, tibiofemoral or um, joint, uh, patero-femoral joint. So tibiofemoral joint is an articulation between the large convex femoral condyles, which you can clearly see on those uh, drawings or pictures, and almost flat, smaller tibial condyles. <coughs> they are almost flat, so the congruity between those bones it's not really great, as you can clearly see. So, um, what can we do with this um, tibiofemoral joint? We already mentioned that flexion, extension, internal, external rotation, so two degrees of freedom. The medial and lateral menisci are crescent shaped, fibrocartilage dislocated within the knee joint. Uh, so be, be between the tibia and femur and the importance of those menisci is of course uh, that it increases the congruity between uh, those two bones otherwise they, those bones really don't perfectly fit one to another our joint would be extremely prone for injuries dislocations if not for the menisci so menisci the fibrocartilage it's extremely important feature, okay? The primary function of menisci, of course, is to reduce the compressions, the stress on the uh, tibiofemoral joint, also to stabilize the motion, to actually move, to flex and extend and rotate the knee. Without the menisci, again, the dislocations would be constant. They also reduce the, the friction between the tibia and femur. Uh, so as you can see, the menisci are extremely important in this very complex and complicated joint. Paterofemoral uh, joint is an articulation between the articular side of the patella and the intracondylar groove of the femur. So again, go back to the picture, gonna orient yourself where exactly is patella and again, patella is also very important for a couple of reasons I already mentioned in the previous slides. So let's uh, go to another slide. And you can have here, what we have here is a, a drawings, an actual picture of a model of menisci. So you can clearly see uh, what's going on, how the menisci are built. You can see that, uh, for example, the medial uh, menisci looks different than the lateral one. The lateral one, uh, the lateral one is almost circular, uh, when the when the medial one is open. It's only like a, a, a quarter moon shape, right? Uh, so of course this is strategically built and strategically positioned to even better increase the congruity between the femur and tibia. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. <coughs> bursas. All right, so we got many of them in the knee. Patellar bursa, superficial uh, infrapatellar bursa, deep infrapatellar bursa, and pes anserine bursa. Your pronunciation of that is probably better than mine. But nevertheless, the, the knee has total of 14 bursas. They form inter-tissue junctions, okay? Some bursas are simply extension of the synovial membrane, but other are external and they position externally to the, to the knee capsule itself, okay? So of course, like with any other uh, bursas in any other parts of our body, with overuse of the joints, they may become inflamed and when they come inflamed, they become very painful and with pain, of course, comes less strength and less range of motion. Okay, <coughs> let's go to the next slide. Tendons, right? So what we can see uh, over here, I would like you uh, to pay attention to the rectus femoris 
quadriceps tendon. This is the tendon with, when, when the knee extensors join together forming that one massive tendon and patella is actually embedded in this one massive uh, uh, tendon which crosses the knee and joins of course right below the knee on the tibia and you can see that very clearly nicely presented on the upper uh, picture or drawing okay um, and you got also other tendons you can see on those pictures so identify for yourself again for that mental picture for that knee map infrapatellar tendon, biceps femoris tendon, and iliotibial tract. Of course, you can do this for yourself. There is not much to explain. So let's go to the next slide. And here we are. <coughs> this is, uh, of course, uh, very important ligaments. Um, and without those ligaments, again, like without menisci, our knee would be practically useless. The dislocations would be constant. So those are very important ligaments. We're going to talk about them, just, um, just the basic information, the, the information which you really should know, okay? So let's about talk about the first two, the anterior and uh, posterior uh, cruciate ligament. Cruciate is from Greek language, which means cross, right? So they are crossing in your body. So let's go maybe to the next slide. Uh, when we can actually see them, right? Uh, uh, so these ligaments cross within the intracondylar notch of the femur. They are considered extrasynovial. Why extrasynovial? Because they lie between the synovial membrane and the capsule of the joint. Okay, that's why they extrasynovial. They are very strong and provide stability. Uh, of course, to the entire knee. These ligaments don't heal. There is no blood supply. So remember, guys, and you know this, of course, there is no blood, there is no healing. Those ligaments do not have their own blood supply. So if something is wrong with those ligaments, usually the patient ends up in surgery because there is no healing. So no amount of therapy would actually heal it, okay? The primary uh, function of, this li uh, of uh, these ligaments uh, is to prevent anterior and posterior dislocation of the knee, okay? Uh, and uh, for short, of course, uh, you can call them ACL and PCL, anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament. And uh, again, they, they crisscross and you can nicely see them uh, one goes from the back to the front and vice versa. So, so, the, so they truly crisscross each other. And uh, you probably heard many times on TV, uh, athletes get injured, uh, whatever they do, runners, footballers, etc., etc. And between the, them two, ACL or PCL, you probably hear more often that something was wrong with the ACL. And the, and the patient, the athlete, needed to go for surgery and then post-surgical treatment therapies usually long, usually last months. Some uh, uh, luckier uh, um, athletes can go back to the sports and some of them actually are out. Uh, okay, so let's talk about now the second pair uh, of ligaments the medial collateral ligament and the lateral colligam, uh, collateral ligament so they are flat and broad they don't look like the ropes like the pcl and acl they, they are kind of flat broad uh, and they lie on the of course on the medial and lateral sides of the knees so just by location you can realize what they are going to do well they are going to protect for the medial lateral dislocations of the knee so they prevent excessive abduction adduction of the bones uh, within the knee so they also we can we can call it they're gonna prevent the um, valgus or varus of the knee or excessive valgus varus uh, within the knee and we're gonna uh, see uh, some of the pictures and drawings 
um, next, okay, or very soon. <coughs> so let's uh, switch to another, uh, 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 yet another view on those ligaments. Uh, you can clearly observe all four of them <coughs> on the next slide, which sim is simply uh, called or titled ligaments. <coughs> Okay, let's go to the next slide. Here we are with anterior drawer tests. So as therapists and perhaps physical therapists are going to do this <coughs> more often, but nevertheless, we can do it too. <coughs> and, and, and it's very important that we know what's going on. <coughs> So in this case, we call it, this is called anterior drawer test. So on the left hand side, you can see a, a patient actually extending the knee. In the middle box, you can see what's happening within the knee when the patient is extending that knee. And on the right hand side, those gonna be your hands or the therapist's hands checking for the integrity of ACL. <clears throat> so, of course, the, if the ACL is working correctly, you should not feel excessive movement or motion within the joint. So, all you do is laying down, the patient is laying down supine and flex the knee, the knee being tested. Then you as a therapist are grasping with both hands right below the knee, just as you can see it on this drawing. You ask your patient to relax and you start gently pull that knee upwards the, the direction of this uh, black arrow on your screen. If you can feel that you have some space and the knee is moving rather readily, that means that ACL is uh, elongated. It, this is an unnatural. That shouldn't happen. That means that uh, that something is already going on and the knee potentially is, uh, is prone for dislocations. Let's go to the next slide. <coughs> Posterior dro uh, drawer uh, test looks very similarly except that this time you're pulling the knee backwards. And again, the same concept. If there is uh, 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 looseness uh, the, or, or this you feel that the knee should not go as much as it did that means that the PCL it's not working correctly per perhaps it's overstretched so you're looking really for that tightness the knee should you should not be able to feel that knee going up or down okay <coughs> so let's go to the next slide Knee flexors, biceps femoris, uh, semitendonesus, and semimembranesus. Uh, so again, you can just appreciate the complexity, the workings of the muscles, where they are, where they originate, where they insert, and what they are responsible. So all of those three muscles together, we commonly call them hamstrings. Okay, let's go to the next slide, which shows knee extensors or the quadriceps we already mentioned. So just by definition, by name, quad means four. So you know that quadriceps, it's an umbrella name for four separate distinguished, the, the distinct muscles. So in this case, we have rectus femoris and three vastuses, vastus intermedius, lateralis, and medialis. Okay, so together, they, they, they are our quadriceps, they come together they, they, um, to, uh, they com combination of all four muscles, all four tendons create this one massive tendon where, where the uh, patella is embedded. We talked about it already. So let's talk, uh, let's go to the uh, to, uh, next slide. Knee rotation. We already mentioned that uh, there is a knee rotation, right? Uh, so uh, lacking the knee in full extension actually requires 10 degrees of external rotation. We don't recognize this because it's not something we do intentionally or we have to think about it. This just happens. So the fact 
that we don't readily recognize that there is external internal rotation it doesn't mean that it's not so again i'm just gonna repeat myself uh technically knee has two degrees of freedom right so uh, so again this slide just shows you the internal workings of the knee and you can see clearly that black line through the joint to show you how the knee actually uh, goes into rotation when you are flexing and extending your knee. So let's go to the next slide. This is a, another example. You can do it at home if you wish. Just draw a line with the marker uh, just like you see on the picture and uh, do that when your knee is flexed, right? Do that when your knee is flexed. So, 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 so you put uh, one above the knee, one uh, below the knee, when the knee is flexed, then extend that knee and see what happens with, with, with those lines. Um, if you wish, you can do it on yourself or you can just trust those pictures, but it clearly shows that rotation. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, all right, deformities. As with everything else, we talk about the good stuff, and now we have to talk about the bad one. So, uh, genu varum, uh, val uh, genu uh, valgum, genu varum, and genu recurvantum. Okay? So, genu valgum represent the angle between the femur and tibia in frontal plane, uh, and normal genu valgum is somewhere between 170 and 175 degrees so what would be abnormal well for our discussion's sake i would say everything five and above would be considered abnormal right we we have to leave a couple of degrees this way or that way because everybody by nature is built a little bit differently and sometimes it's okay that doesn't mean that it's a problem but five degrees more this way or that way we can say okay that's not really normal okay uh, so again everything more than 180 degrees or less than 165 degrees you see i'm giving that five degrees window here and um, this way and that way we would say that hmm something is going on okay so you can clearly see this uh, these conditions over here if somebody has a genu varum the soccer players right uh we we put a, call it uh, bowed legs uh, genu valgum is knocking the knees and genu recurvantum is when the knee actually goes to the back right that looks uh, sometimes really really awkward so uh by the uh, anatomy and the differences between men uh, and uh, women or male and female you most likely are going to see men with bowed legs and women with uh, knock knees right that's because of the size of the pelvis and the angulation of the femurs uh, uh, as of, uh, to the pelvis and then of course uh, the activities uh, the, the muscles kick in and i'm not saying 100 percent because there are some women in uh, both leg and some men with knock knees but again we're going to this stereotypical thinking and stereotypical view you most likely are going to see the vice versa right okay so let's go to the next slide this is uh normal genu valgum or valgus sometimes you can see in the literature authors refer to it as a valgum sometimes valgus so similarly to upper extremity really nothing changes it's the same concept right so we got this uh, longitudinal axis uh, or or a perfect perpendicular line through the lower extremity and then we have the bones which are not going in this perfect perpendicular uh, fashion towards the uh, towards the ground or the floor you have some inclination of those bones so you can see, clearly see on this drawing that the femur and tibia are in in some way not perfectly aligned 
and that's normal so again you can see on that picture the the angulation was was measured and between the femur and tibia that should be that 170 to 175 degrees and we already discussed this in the previous in the previous slide this is just uh, to kind of confirm our findings so let's go to the next slide here we are genuvalgum may occur from abnormal al alignment at the hip or the ankles remember that if one joint is affected the others uh, the other ones will be affected as well okay so we, we don't stop just at the hip hip affects the knee knee automatically will affect the ankle and vice versa everything is connected right so of course increased uh, strain over the medial collateral ligaments some ligaments uh, are going to be compressed the other ones are going to be decompressed the same thing with muscles certain muscles are going to be contracted the other ones are going to be unusually elongated the same thing happens with the with the um, capsule of the joints one side is going to be compressed the other one is going to be decompressed or unnatural naturally elongated so if we are not in perfect alignment there is always something going on and this is never good okay let's go to the next slide you can see actual pictures of people uh, suffering from in this case genu valgum or valgus right all three pictures represent um, the same the same people now on the right hand side appears to me as is a child in the middle pictures appears to me as an is an adult and on the left hand side it's hard to say right so uh, and it's a, it's it's uh, and the right and middle it's bad but on the left hand side uh, i don't think that this person can actually use lower extremities for for any type of walking okay let's go to the next slide here you got a a, a youtube uh, address so i encourage you to and those are very very short those are not like the movies 15 20 minutes those are literally few seconds long so i encourage you just to uh, copy and paste this address and and just simply go on youtube and check it out genuvarum you can you can see over here uh very small child and old man right so and an x-ray of bones how does this look inside and on the right hand side it's a surgery with this external device very slowly progressively straightening up uh, the joint and bones uh, this process is uh, lasts sometimes a year or more depending of the severity of the condition of course so let's go to the next slide and again you get a very very short uh, youtube video clip I encourage you to just take a look at that. It's literally seconds long. Genu recurvantum. This is, uh, of course, on the right hand side, you can see a, a young woman uh, with, let's call it, mild case or genu recurvantum. But in the middle and on the left hand side, you be the judge. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, general recurvantum what can be done is this anything could be done right so on the picture a on on the left hand side we can see abnormally long external moment arm look at that external um, uh, moment arm this is way too long what's happening uh, to the back of the knee everything is overstretched the capsule is overstretched the ligaments are overstretched the muscles are overstretched so this is not a good situation uh, so we know just by looking at that external moment arm um, we know that the patient body weight makes the things even worse because now you got that pressure going downwards constantly because of the uh, gravitational pull so the knee capsule is overstretched everything is uh, overstretched and this condition can practically uh, 
paralyze the knee, right? So in the picture B, what could be done, and that was without surgery, it was actually very simple solution. Patient uh, wearing tennis shoe with build up heel. And what happens then? This causes tilt of the tibia, therefore the knee goes forward, and at the same time, external moment arm gets shorter to the point where it should be, and you can clearly see now that capsule is actually slacked, muscles are not overstretched, ligaments and tendons are not overstretched, so everything came back to the normal position. Of course, this person uh, uh, needed to be issued the appropriate um, shoes or at least the inserts. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Another video. This one is somehow a little bit disturbing. Uh, it, it lasts again probably 30 seconds, maybe a minute, uh, maybe not even, but uh, take a look. Definitely worth seeing. Windswept deformity. So here again, on the left hand side is actually 83 year old female, uh, and on the right hand side you have a small child, right? So uh, it really doesn't doesn't matter how old people are; they can suffer from those con conditions. The child is of course born with those conditions when the older person could be born with those conditions or could be acquired through life and age. Let's go uh, to the next. Here we already discussed this uh, somehow, but I promise that we are going to talk about that one more time. What's happening if people, uh, let's say, shatter their patella? A patella cannot be rescued uh, and has to be removed. So first and foremost, patella is for protection. So, uh, so kneeling or getting accidentally hit on the knee without patella could be potentially much more dangerous than with patella, of course. It's like a, a protective shield. And, uh, but, but more, uh, or in addition to it, actually the quadriceps muscles uh, that, that, that large tendon of the quadriceps muscles, so the quadriceps muscles actually depend on a patella to do the work the, um, the quadriceps is designed to do, meaning knee extension. Without the patella, the internal moment arms are going to be affected, right? So internal moment arms, external moment arms, this, this is all going to be affected by lack of the patella, by the removal of the patella. By the way, the, the procedure is called patellectomy. So it was calculated that, let's say, for argument's sake, with patella, the joint can produce 100% of the, uh, the force, or the muscles are allowed to perform 100% of the force, uh, and after the patellectomy of or removal of the patella, the muscles can do only 75%, uh, assuming that the muscle work equally hard. All right, so instead of 100% of the force, the muscle uh, produce only 75% of the same force using the same energy. All right, so so without patella muscle lose 25 percent 25 percent of its force capacity so uh, in other words patella gives that anchor or anchors appropriately the muscle okay well, let's uh, go to the next slide and here it's uh, it's another yet another picture or drawing explaining the role of the patella and why muscle work the way they work uh, with patella and why they are weaker without patella. And you have a crane on the left hand side and on the right hand side you have um, the drawing, the representation of human lower extremity and you can see the similarities to the crane, right? So if, the cra if, if you affect the, the crane 
axis of rotation uh, one way or the other is going to negatively affect the ability of the crane to lift weight and the same thing happens um, in human body. The uh, next slide shows you the again the deformities of the knees uh, before surgery and the last picture uh, picture C shows you the same person after the total knee replacements right so on the left hand side you got that um, old person the old lady on the right hand side you have an x-rays of those knees of that person's knees and on the bottom of course there was no other choice at this time no therapy is gonna help um, no traditional methods um, could be uh, utilized in this case so the knee simply had to be removed for the titanium ones and you have a, a clear picture the x-ray on the bottom uh, the next uh, uh, picture also shows you another type of surgery uh, uh, slightly less invasive than the uh, than the, you, what you saw in the first uh, first slide uh, this you can you can clearly see that the bones are still intact more or less they weren't cut out and replaced by the titanium parts here you you can see the titanium plates rather put on the surface of the existing bones to give them that extra support okay let's go and there is no more slides so i thank you very much for your attendance and i will see you shortly uh, i believe we have two more presentations so bear with me bye